Good evening all, and welcome. Fey, cryptids, goblins, gnomes, they're all very interesting creatures, and I'd like to thank Christy for selecting tonight's video topic. She did this with the use of a power token, which can be obtained via Patreon. To find out more info, the link is on the top of the description. Be sure to prepare yourself adequately when encountering these creatures, as they can be very dark indeed. So now, it's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I dated a guy in high school whose family was from Norway. When he was 10, his family all went back to Norway in the summertime to stay at his mother's parents' farm. It was a working farm that was also attached to a large forest. David was told that he could go anywhere on the farm that he wanted, and into the forest, up some agreed-upon boundary no further line. Of course, being ten, he disobeyed, and went further into the forest. He was walking along, having found a path, when he started hearing someone yelling in Norwegian. He came around a bend, and found what he described as a gnome. The gnome was about the height of a four-year-old. He was adult, had a full beard, and his clothes looked handmade. He had the typical gnome-type hat. I'm pretty sure he said it was red, but I could be wrong. I do know that his suit was in light browns or greens, pretty much forest colours. The gnome was screaming at David in Norwegian, shaking his fists. David spoke Norwegian at home, but this form of Norwegian he couldn't really understand, although to him it sounded familiar enough for him to think that it was Norwegian. The thing that really had him flawed was that the gnome was buried up to his knees in the hard dirt path. He wasn't trying to pull himself out, so David did not think that he was stuck. It seemed to him that that was a normal thing for the gnome. David fled the scene, and made it back safely to his grandpa's farm. When he got there, he sat down on a bench along the wall to catch his breath. His mum saw him running, and came and sat beside him. She said to him, You went too far into the woods, didn't you? He could only nod his head. At the time, he told me this. His mother had never said another word to him about it and he never asked her about it either. It drove me crazy, and I bugged him to ask her more and more, but he never did. I've tried to find him online, as he has a very odd last name, but I never have. If I do, I'd like to ask him more questions about his mother, and the gnomes in the forest by their farm. I am of Mexican descent, and in our culture, the dead and spirits are a big part of it, as you know by Dia de los Muertos. Now, as a kid, my family would always share ghost stories from the old country in Mexico. I would like to share a few, if you're interested. This one is from my grandma. She states that when she was a little girl, she saw the devil himself. Back then, circa 1940s, many families were poor, and I mean very poor. She lived in a poor village in Guerrero, and to go to the bathroom, you needed to take a nice trip into the forest, even at night, in pitch darkness, with only the stars and moon to guide you. She was peering, and when she walked back home, she heard what sounded like a parade of horses coming her way. Of course, that would not be possible, as it was pitch black. And... No one travelled the roads at that time. That's when she saw a figure, mounted on one horse, and not many like she'd heard, and he did not look up. Just told her something and kept going, and then shortly disappeared. When she arrived home, her mother saw all her hairs standing on end. This, in her village, meant only one thing, contact with an evil presence. Another story she encountered was the famous weeping woman, La Llorona, 
in a similar situation while out in the woods at night. She said a woman, half white and half shadow, was walking down a dirt road while crying and giving out loud laments. You could not see her face, and she didn't seem to have any legs as she floated down the road. This story is from my parents. In Mexico and in other places in Latin America, there are many accounts of duendes or gnomes and evil natured spirits such as nahuales, shapeshifters, which I suppose are similar to skinwalkers, and chaneques, forest imps, as well as hadas, fairies. My mother told me this story of her sister, who had a baby daughter. One night, my aunt was sleeping. They lived in a village where the forests are your backyard, and she said she saw a little child walk around and making noise. She had a young son, but he was sleeping in his room. The girl was newborn and could not walk yet, so she had no idea who this child was. She called the child thinking it was her son, and it ran towards her room and darted under her bed. When she looked down getting ready to scold the child, as she thought it was her son playing into the late hours of the night, there's nothing there. In Mexico, it is believed that gnomes can take the souls of children, effectively ending their lives. This almost happened to my father. He was at his grandmother's house playing in the yard, and she had many trees. Bear in mind, this is when he was a kid, when suddenly, he saw a bunch of naked children on the top of a tree calling his name and gesturing him to climb up. He asked his grandma if he could play with the kids, but of course she saw nothing up there and held him inside because she knew what it was. She said some prayer, completely freaking out my dad, and said that he was not allowed to play there again. In another instance though, unfortunately, he was playing with his baby cousin, sitting in a baby chair, when suddenly his cousin just dropped her head like she had fallen asleep. But she hadn't fallen asleep. She had passed away. My dad called over his aunt, and when examining her, they found marks on her neck as if she had been strangled by an unseen force. My mother said that her father and neighbour were enemies, but there was something about this neighbour that scared the locals. There were many rumours and claims that he was a Nawa. This is because, when that home was sold, they found, hidden within, a book of spells, witchcraft and satanism, and had Nawal related entries. The final story involves a ghost from the Mexican Revolution. My mother was a young girl. This is basically a repeat of my grandmother's story. She went out to use the bathroom in the late hours of the night, when she looked up and saw a man dressed in revolutionary clothing sitting upon a rock. No one was out at those times, and he had an old Mexican Revolution type sombrero and just looked into my mother's direction, but he had no face. He was just a silhouette. She got up as fast as she could and ran back inside. It is said in her village that a Mexican revolutionary guerrilla soldier was executed in that spot, hung from a tree, and it was common in the times as most revolutionaries were either hung or had a firing squad shoot them as their execution. When I was six, I was out back in my grandfather's house in the woods, and I had a small dog named Nova. Well, I was an outdoor child and hated playing inside, so I took my dog and went for walks in the woods. My grandfather has a shed right at the tree line. This time I decided to play to the right of the shed, maybe 10 feet away. My dog started growling over and there was a hole underneath it, so I assumed a groundhog lived there. I ignored him and continued playing. Then I heard a shuffling sound and looked over, and I swear to God I saw two short little dudes with little pointy hats on. I don't remember the colour of their clothes, but they were bright and very noticeable against the light blue shed. 
They stared at me and stopped moving when I saw them. Then I grabbed Nova and ran back to the house and never saw them again. But ever since I've had a ridiculous irrational fear of gnomes. It's so bad that I wouldn't go into my friend's house one time when I picked him up. I literally waited outside the car because I saw his mum had gnomes out front. It sounds silly, but I am now scared to death of them. I am now in my late 60s. The experience I'll briefly relate here took place on the southern Gold Coast in Queensland in 1984. Our house was less than 10 years old, as were all the others in the area. At the time the event took place, I was divorced and lived in the house with my two young children. I am neither a drinker of alcohol nor a user of drugs. They have never been a part of my life. I had no interest in fairies, goblins, gnomes, elves or the like, nor have I been reading about them or watching anything about them on TV. If asked if I believe in the little people, I would have unhesitatingly replied no. In 1984, I attended a seminar in New Zealand, along with several dozen other Aussies. I'd recently developed a fear of plane travel, although previously I'd enjoyed it. A local chemist whom I knew had given me three or four tablets to take an hour before departure to settle my nerves. I took one prior to our departure from New Zealand. Consequently, I slept from New Zealand to Sydney where we changed planes. And I slept from Sydney to Brisbane, then slept through the drive from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. The driver, a colleague, carried my suitcase into my home. He conducted a cursory check on the premises before departing. My children were all in the care of a neighbour. It was very rare to have a night to myself. Being well rested and relaxed, I was looking forward to spending a few hours reading or watching TV. First I made a cup of tea. The television was on, the front main door was open, but the security screen catch was locked. As I sipped the tea, I decided I may as well unpack. I carried an armload of clothes into my bedroom and hung them in my wardrobe. I noticed the light in the room seemed unusually bright. Something was strange about the atmosphere. I had no time to analyse it before I was overcome with exhaustion so intense that I'd only had time to stagger backwards into bed. I lay face up on the bed. I was concerned my shoes might make a mark on the bedspread. I looked down to make sure only my heels were resting on the bedspread, and that was that. I lost consciousness. Next I knew I could hear the sounds of several voices. They were argumentative voices that seemed to tell each other to hurry. I managed to lift my head and look down to the source of the voices. There were several small people. They were trying to pull me from the bed, feet first and into the wardrobe. The wardrobe was only half a metre approx from the foot of the bed and I saw that the left hand side of the wardrobe was open. The wardrobe had two sliding doors. I'd hung the clothes on the right hand side, which had required both wardrobe doors to be pushed to the left. And now, the little people were trying to pull me into the left hand side, which would have required someone to push both doors to the right. I should explain here that during the event, I must have been operating similar to a video camera in that I saw and heard only, and what I saw and heard must have been committed to memory. At the time, however, I did not experience normal thought process. So what I remembered after, and now, is the product of my mental video camera. At the time, it did not dawn on me that the doors had been moved. I simply saw several small people trying to pull me from the bed and into the open half of the wardrobe. I experienced no shock or alarm, Instead, I told myself I had lots of time to continue sleeping because I was far too big and heavy for them to move very far. Now, I am of the opinion those thoughts were not my own, but were in some way suggested to me. Whatever the case, I must have lost consciousness again, because the next thing I can remember is waking up to find several people crowded around me. 
They didn't speak as far as I know. I was now lying with my head at the foot of the bed, so my feet must have been at the head of the bed. Again, I was similar to a video camera. I have very clear memory of how these people appeared. There were males and females. I can't remember how many, but at least six or more. One, a male, was larger than the others and appeared to be their leader. He was closest to me. At first, he stared into my eyes with both of his. Then, a blank, and his position had changed, and he was looking at me with only one of his eyes. Something happened there, but I can't remember. I suspect he was imparting something to me. The creature appeared as the typical gnomes or peasants from storybooks. Based on the height of the bed, their height was perhaps two to three and a half feet tall. They were overdressed. Their clothing was suited to a much colder climate. I can remember that in considerable detail, possibly because in those days I did a lot of home sewing. They were Caucasian, their skin looked weathered as if they worked outdoors a lot, and their skin had a muddy cast. They had strong facial bones, wide cheekbones, wide jaws, strong chins and noses. Their eyes and mouths were long horizontally, but vertically narrow and seemed recessed between the strong facial bones. The best way to describe their faces is as squashed, as if a heavy weight had been placed on top of their heads, squashing them downwards. Their bodies were stout, robust, with deep cut chests, broad waists and strong shoulders. I couldn't see the bottom half too well, and I must have lost consciousness again, because when I saw them next, I was still in the same position, but they were now in the centre of the room looking at me. I looked back at them and still felt no fear nor alarm. I just looked at them and they at me. I had no thought process at the time. There seemed to be more of them than before. Among them were a couple of younger males who seemed a bit more nervous or unsure. The other men were impassive. The women, however, seemed to enjoy my predicament. Based on my mental video recording, I later regarded them as overworked, joyless, and not over-intelligent. It seemed I was simply a job to them, and they seemed a bit nervous. Next, I was aware of their voices again. As before, querulously talking over the top of each other and arguing to hurry. I raised my head, and to my alarm, I saw that they'd almost succeeded in pulling my legs from the bed. My body was now right way up on the bed, with my head against the head of the bed and my feet near the wardrobe. When I'd seen that they almost pulled all of my legs from the bed, a surge of adrenaline shot through me, and I grasped that it couldn't be much longer before gravity did the rest of the job for them. All they'd have to do would be to steer my falling body into the wardrobe. I yelled out and kicked at them. Then I jumped from the bed and into the centre of the room. The room seemed far too bright, and I remember standing there yelling at them. I still wasn't afraid, I was angry. They muttered between themselves, and they looked and sounded resigned and bitter. Then they fled into the open half of the wardrobe. They seemed to go in, then down, as if filing down a ramp inside the wardrobe. I stood there watching them for probably a few seconds. Then, still, with the light seeming far brighter than usual, I turned towards the only door and left the room. It was only a small house. The hallway was only three or four meters long, and I left the room went through the hallway towards the living room, and that's when I became completely consumed with terror. Nothing happened between yelling at the creatures and making it towards the living room, but in those few seconds I was overtaken by sheer horror, which seemed to escalate with every instant. I've never known fear like it, yet there was no real reason for it. I suspect now that when the creatures departed, they removed whatever calming influence they'd subjected me to during the ordeal itself. After phoning the colleague who dropped me off earlier that evening, I stumbled out of the house and into the middle of the road. I was desperate to be with someone, and was moaning in the hopes that someone could come and rescue me. I was completely without shame, and must have been reduced to the level of a small child, 
But I must stress that I wasn't afraid, consciously at least, that the little creatures would return and attack me. There wasn't a real focus for the terror. It just was. Horror feeding into more horror. Not long after, my colleague returned and drove me to his house. He didn't speak to me. I didn't care. I was just glad to be with someone and to be getting away from my house. When we arrived at his place, I got into bed but couldn't get warm. He put a pile of blankets on top of me but I was still freezing. Now I realise I was in shock. I wouldn't let him leave the room or turn off the lights. I must have fallen asleep. When I awoke, he wasn't there. Next morning, he wouldn't discuss any of it. I was anxious, he thought I'd gone insane, and tried to explain what happened. He didn't want to talk about it, but he did say that he'd never seen anyone as terrified as I had been when he saw me in the road. We never discussed it again. Despite that, we married the following year. When I asked him how long had elapsed between when he dropped me off after our return from New Zealand and receiving my phone call asking to come and get me, it seemed the entire experience of the little people had been no more than 15 minutes. In approximately 2004, I decided to submit an account of the experience in the 20 years which had elapsed. I had searched in the hopes of discovering others that had had similar experiences without success. There was no internet then, of course, so I was reliant on books. I found only one mention in a book by Jenny Randalls, who said 7% of aliens had been described as looking like gnomes. It was a relief to discover. I was not alone in my experience, although I did not believe the creatures I'd seen to be an extraterrestrial. When I decided in 2004, to leave a record of my experience somewhere, I didn't know where to submit it. Finally, I chose an organisation which was UFO Research Group in Queensland, the QLD. The QLD Research Group replied to say in response to my inquiry, they'd had no record of anyone else having an experience with gnome-type entities. They asked if they could publish my account in their forthcoming magazine, and I replied that it was fine on the condition that my identity not be disclosed. Some weeks later, the research group got in touch with me. They were astounded by the latest developments. They said the day before, a woman in Melbourne had phoned them. She'd been close to hysterical and claimed that gnome-type creatures had been running through her house for a few hours. Her adult daughter was present at the time, and the woman wanted someone to go to her house to rid them of the gnomes. The Queensland UFO Research Group said they told the woman they'd contacted someone closer to her about the situation, which they did. Apparently, the QLD group had contacted the Melbourne UFO Research Group and had given them the woman's contact info. In telling me this, the following day, the research group said it was impossible for the Melbourne woman to have known about my experience, because the QLD group magazine had been delivered to their printer mere hours before the Melbourne woman contacted them. In other words, the QLD magazine hadn't even been printed yet, let alone distributed. The group said they couldn't get over the coincidence, nor could they understand why both the Melbourne woman and I, as I live in Sydney, had contacted a group in Queensland. I said I had most probably contacted them because of my own experience occurred in Queensland. I asked the group to forward me the details of the woman in Melbourne because I was eager to compare notes with her. She was the only other person I knew of who had experienced anything. But when the QLD group replied, it was to tell me that the Melbourne woman had told them she didn't want to be contacted, not by me or anyone else. The Queensland group told me this was often the case. They said people wanted help at the time, but once the situation was resolved, or they'd calmed down, they become afraid their experience will be reported in the media. They're afraid they'll be subjected to ridicule, generally, and particularly by those they know, such as neighbours and employers. My account was subsequently published in the magazine, in hard copy and online. My identity had not been revealed, and I've been identified only as C. Unfortunately, publication of my experience did not succeed in encouraging others to come forward, 
with similar experiences. I grew up in an old house in the south, kind of in the middle of nowhere. The house was laid out somewhat circular, as you could walk from the living room through most other rooms just by walking in a complete circle, and end up back where you started. When I was around five, me and my younger sister were chasing each other in circles, while my mum cooked dinner. I was in front of her, and we were laughing and carrying on. When we got into the dining room, in the inside corner, there was a small greenish creature with a dark cloak on. It had pointy ears that stuck out and sharp teeth. I was young, but it was still very small, so perhaps two feet. It looked kind of like it had been at the bottom of a pond, very old and tattered. It put its finger up to its lips and was grinning. I slammed to a stop and my sister was chasing so close that she ran right into me, which pushed us both into the corner, into the kitchen. We both started screaming, and my mum ran to us to see what was the matter, but the thing had gone. This has haunted me for years, I'm 25 now, and although I've done tons of research, I've never found anything that really fits what we saw. For a long time I thought maybe I'd imagined it, if it weren't for my sister also seeing it, or my mum remembering our very real terror, I probably would have just written it off. Are there any ideas that you guys have of what this could be? There were lots of weird things happening in the house when I was young, disembodied voices, things moving, very strange dreams, but that was obviously the weirdest and most unsettling. We still kind of talk about it from time to time, and it always makes us feel kind of yucky. My Encounter with the Fae This story is one of my first memories. It takes place either shortly before or shortly after my third birthday, that will be the last week in June 1980. My mum and I went to West Virginia to celebrate my birthday with her side of the family. We were living in Aberdeen, Maryland at the time, so it wasn't too long of a trip. My mum's family lives in the small town of Shady Springs in Raleigh country. Shady Springs is nestled in the lush forest of the Irish mountain. One day, my cousin Leonard, who at the time was known as Eugene, decided that he would take me into the woods. I remember he had a rifle on his back, so I'm assuming he was hunting something. Raccoon or squirrel. Now, why my mum or the rest of the family allowed Leonard to take a three-year-old into the woods is beyond my comprehension, but I guess it's a different era. So Leonard took me into the woods, and we walked around for a while. I remembered being in awe of how massive it all seemed. Then again, everything seems larger to a three-year-old. I don't know how long we walked for, since children have a scrawny sense of time, but apparently I became tired or became a nuisance. My cousin Leonard decided to leave me sitting on a log while he continued wandering the woods. Really? You're going to leave a three-year-old alone in the woods when there are bears and snakes? Leonard, before this, used to torment me with stories about bears, which could explain my little fear about bears. So, Leonard left me alone in the woods. While I sat there for what felt like hours, I was starting to become afraid of the animal noises that were coming from deeper in the woods, and that just seemed to be getting closer. I had no idea how to get back to my grandparents' house, and I was just about to start crying when I looked over at a tree that was about 30 feet away. At the foot of the tree were some little men. I'm not talking dwarfs, more like the size of a squirrel. These men were sitting around the base of a tree and smoking pipes. They wore red hats and had beards. They were looking right at me. They must have realized I was frightened over the whole experience. They smiled and all pointed in one direction. I don't know why, but I decided to follow the direction they were pointing. It felt as if I were walking a very long time, 
But eventually I returned to my grandparents' house. I started yelling for my mum. She came outside and was shocked to see that I had come home without my cousin. She asked where he was, and I told her that he had left me alone in the woods. Needless to say, he heard about that from my mum, my grandparents and his mother. It wasn't until years later that I told her about the little men who had pointed my way out of the woods. It wasn't until much later, when researching fairies, that I discovered that I was helped by gnomes, or some similar species to the gnome family. Most newspapers, you know, publish strong, solid facts, for the most part. While I was out in Mexico, I was reading a newspaper, and as I got to a few pages in, did I read something shocking. This newspaper had published a paranormal account of a woman. Allegedly, she and her family were living in a house that her father owned many years ago. There was a well in the house, and it was well known folklore that in that well, there resided creatures, fey, dwarves, call them what you will, but they lived there. So as the story goes, one day, for whatever reason, a member of the family disturbed the well. And since then, terrible happenings happened to the family. Stuff would go missing, children would get sick, animals would become terrified of going outside and misbehave. And generally, people were not having a good time. Hearing disembodied voices, and having night terrors, waking up screaming in the middle of the night. When her father came over to inspect the family, he realised that the well had been disturbed, and that the creatures were coming out. This was terrible. By disturbing these ancient creatures, they had summoned havoc into their household, and it wouldn't stop until the creatures were appeased. So they got together an offering, put it at the base of the well, and fixed the disturbance. And within a day or so, everything stopped, and the family went back to normal. Now this, of course, is an interesting experience to say the least. But the greater picture in question is the fact that it was published in a newspaper with an accompanying image of the well. Does this mean that folklore plays a greater part in some parts of the world, and things that people often dismiss as lies in other countries and cultures are considered and simply well known as true and out of our knowledge. This happened to my parents, and if anyone has any theories on what this could be, I'd love to hear from you. So basically right now, my family is living in the house my dad grew up in. One time, I asked my dad if he had any paranormal experiences, and after a bit of thinking, he remembered this story. When my dad was young, he said he woke up late in the night needing water, so he got up to go to the kitchen to get some. Right as he turned into the entrance of the kitchen, he looked in, and by the toaster he saw a little man of about 12 inches high, peering into the toaster. He described him as looking very old with white hair and a wrinkly face. As soon as the man noticed my dad, he disappeared. Like there one second gone the next. My dad doesn't know how to explain it, other than maybe he imagined it. The next bit makes me think it might not have been his imagination. I asked my mum the same question if she had any previous paranormal experiences in the house. I kid you not, this is what she said. She said one morning she walked into the kitchen and by the toaster, which was on the other end of the counter from where my dad experienced this. There was a little old man. She said that when she saw him, he laughed and disappeared. My jaw kind of dropped, and I asked her to show me roughly how tall he was and she motioned 12 inches. At that point I thought it was a joke, but I told her that my dad had a very similar experience, and she actually looked a little spooked. I asked if she had any knowledge of my dad's experience, and she said no. 
I then told my dad about it, and he thought I was making it up. They both had never told each other. After this whole thing, I researched about the little people, and came across the brownies, which are apparently house fairies. I don't know what to think of them, though. I've had a few paranormal experiences throughout my life, but the strangest and most unbelievable was what I now know I used to see as a child, when I was around seven or so. A gnome. It wouldn't even have been as tall as my knee, probably halfway up to my shin. It had a red hat and a white beard, a typical garden gnome, only he wasn't a statue. I saw him at least a dozen times through our living room window, frolicking about in the garden and along the window sill outside. I'd sometimes see him in his silhouette through the blinds if they were closed on a sunny day. Parents obviously always brushed it off as the silly nonsense kids come out with when I told them what I saw. Oh, don't be silly. Ah, oh, you never did. Never pay any attention to them. Why would they? I even remember my father saying something to my mum like, we don't even have a garden though. And she responded that it was just an act of imagination. I lived there till I was 18 or 19. I don't even think anyone in our street owned a garden gnome at all. He never even looked at me, like he didn't even know I was watching, or perhaps he didn't care. The last time I saw him was about 20 years ago. I've never spoken to it with anyone, but my mother and sister during my adult life, else I'd probably be admitted to a mental health ward. When I asked my mum, she still remembers me talking about it when I was little. I know that most people think that this is probably a load of rubbish, but I promise you it's true. Was he real, or possibly a fabricated memory of some kind? Why would my mind make me remember fake stuff, and on more than one occasion? Has this ever happened to anyone? Just so you know, this happened in the western suburbs of Sydney, Australia. It was our second year in our new house in the suburbs, specifically in the Philippines, Cagayan de Oro City. I was eight years old when I first discovered that the thing I thought just exists in stories was actually true, and I experienced it. It was a Sunday afternoon when we were told to get our butts moving because we were going to go to the mall. I was excited and happy that after a long weekend, I could go to spend a day at the mall playing at the arcade. So normally I would get too excited and active. I took a shower and was so loud and noisy and little did I know stuff was about to hit the fan. I was asking my babysitter if she saw where my shirt was and she pointed it out to my left side. And when I tried to look towards where my shirt was, my head slowly tilted to the right. I didn't bother it at first, and naturally I tried to move my head straight, but, to my inconvenience, a very sharp pain took my neck, slowly and slowly. I couldn't do anything but tilt my head to the right. I shouted to everyone in the house for help, and my babysitter rushed to me. At first she thought I was joking, till she realised that I was in pain. So what we did was go to my grandma's sister to check on me. And she replied, Itim na duende. She was annoyed by my antics, that I was too noisy, so slapping me was enough to make me realise my rudeness. A duende is a dwarf like creature in Filipino folklore. From what I remember, there are two types of them the ones that are mostly good, and the evil types. And to my stupid luck, I pissed off one of the bad ones. After we visited my grandmother's sister, we eventually went into the mall. I ate KFC, and I specifically remember what I ate. It was spaghetti. I think they only served that in the Philippines, by the way. After that, we went home. A few days later, I can tilt my head a bit further to the other side, and look like a normal person again. My mum heard what happened to me, and told my babysitter to offer a black native chicken as a peace offering for my misdeeds. Then the day after, I was back to normal. 
after the encounter, we let our house be blessed by a Magnamont, a witch doctor, but specialising in healing instead of hurting. And nothing bad paranormal ever happened there again. I was around seven or eight, and every morning when I would wake, I would go into my grandma's room and lay in bed with her until she awoke. One morning, I go in and get the blankets and lay down with her. I look over and next to the dresser in front of the closet are two six to eight inch little men. I just stared at them frozen because I was terrified. I finally closed my eyes and hoped they would go away. I opened them up and they were gone. I've always wondered if what I saw was real, but I can picture it so vividly, like I can even remember what they were wearing. One had a red shirt and the other had an orange shirt. I'm 30 now, and to this day I am profoundly terrified of garden gnomes, like panicky, sweaty, and racing heart kind of scared. Any idea what they could have been, or if I have a good reason to be afraid of them. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's video. Great suggestion, well, selection, by Christy. I really enjoyed the stories, super interesting. I'd never really heard much about them, so it was a lot of fun to research and read. So yeah, what did you guys think of it? If you liked it, drop a like, leave a comment with your thoughts, let's talk about what you liked, and yeah, let's start a conversation. Oh, and uh, if you're new here, feel free to subscribe and press the bell icon to be notified every time I post. Every night. Yep, if you have a story that you would like to share, feel free to drop it in my email or post it on my Reddit. Either are fine. Such an interesting topic. Anyway, speaking of interesting topics, we are carrying on with unusual topics for the next few weeks. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do tomorrow. But it's going to be a good one, I can guarantee. Stuff that you really don't often hear from me or other narrators for that fact. So be sure to stick around, it's going to be super interesting and I really hope you like it. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.